All right, we're going to take a little bit of a look at how the Industrial Revolution spreads from its initial uh, starting point in Great Britain and expands across the European continent. It will eventually reach uh, the United States, but we're not concerning ourselves with that in this course of study. So we'll mostly look at how it spreads uh, throughout the continent of Europe. So uh, in terms of following Great Britain's lead, and really Great Britain is way far ahead in terms of... Uh, this whole industrialization but following their lead uh, you have belgium as being the second quickest nation to industrialize and this is uh it shouldn't be that surprising in a way it is because we we don't think often of belgium as being an important player in uh, european history but they were vitally important in the agricultural revolution and they also have tons of natural resources specifically iron and coal which we recall from uh, great britain are major catalysts of the uh, industrial revolution so the fact that belgium has these helps them to industrialize but it's not just belgium that industrializes at this time we have all european nations seeing a gradual increase in their industrialization level uh, and there are many factors that affect the rate of industrial growth among those you have the increases in agricultural output you have a growing population you have more foreign trade this is this is in part because of this movement away from mercantilism so more people are interested in trading with each other, but also with colonies throughout the world. Also, you see this rise of availability of capital. Because there's more money from this foreign trade, more people are willing to invest their capital in industry and in potentially risky ventures. So these kind of all lead to this industrial growth. Um, and again, there's some other reasons for continental industrialization. They all have, these countries all have a long tradition of the putting out system, and this prepares them for industry. So this idea of people manufacturing in the home um, <clears throat> and some small scale exists throughout the continent. And so people are used to being productive in some sort of manner and producing uh, goods for use. There is also the technology for industrialization already exists. These countries on the continent, France and Belgium and Germany and the others, they don't have to invent this technology. It exists in Great Britain. So they're able to just import those ideas and then use them. Uh, and so they don't have to have any great inventors on their own. That kind of hard work has already been done for them. And then the other thing that's really key for industrialization on the continent, and it partly explains why this doesn't happen overseas, is that they have strong independent governments. So places like Prussia and France and Belgium, and even to some extent Russia, they have strong governments, or at least, very least, they're independent. They're not colonies. They're not relying on some other country to run them. So because of this, they're able to make decisions on their own. They don't have to rely on some other country across the, across the, uh, the world to make those decisions for them. They can make these decisions themselves. And so that spurs on this industrialization. Uh, three kind of major causes of industrialization. First, you have British mechanics who sneak technology and machines out of their country. It was illegal for uh, British machinists and leaders of industry to sometimes to even move to the continent, but specifically they were not allowed to take blueprints for machines or actual machines to the continent. Now, just because it's illegal does not mean people aren't going to do it. So you have a number of people making this exodus from Great Britain. The most famous, of course, is William Cockerell, who goes with his son to Belgium to create industry there and really creates a large, booming textile industry there. But there are other skilled British workers who leave the continent or leave England for the continent. On the continent, there's a big number of entrepreneurs throughout uh, mostly Prussia, but also other countries who are looking for the next business venture. These are the middle class, the merchants who suddenly uh, have access to more goods and are looking to make more money and recognize that there's profit in industry. And so these entrepreneurs make a big name for themselves. And lastly, the governments begin to step in to take action in order to help industrialization actually occur. The biggest thing that they do is they create tariff protections on their goods. That is, they raise the taxes on imports, and by doing so, it protects their developing, fledgling industry. So, a shirt coming in from England, let's use the cotton textile, for example. So, a shirt coming in from England would be assessed a tax, and because of that tax, tax, it would suddenly become more expensive than a shirt that was made within your country. So, this way, these tariffs are used as protection uh, and a way to, to kind of encourage 
industry and growth within your country at the same time discouraging imports. And another big thing that the governments do is they get behind these ideals of the railroad. Railroads are super expensive to make and it requires a lot of labor and a lot of capital and a lot of time tied up in that. And so very few private investors are willing to create railroads. It requires at the very least government subsidies and support. And so these government uh, governments on the continent are willing to take that risk and to build the railroads because they've seen the benefits to those railroads in England. And so you have this uh, kind of major railroad boom in on the continent thanks to the government. Uh, one of the major people who comes around at this time is a German, a Prussian by the name of Frederick List, and he's got a really key concept known as economic nationalism and what he argues is that the growth of the economy is incredibly important to the nation and in fact uh, the best way for a nation to gain power and supremacy is by having a strong uh, economy and he also says that manufacturing is the best way to increase the well-being of people and to in fact eliminate poverty. So he is actually caring for the good of his people. And really this finds a lot of, uh, kind of a lot of traction in Europe at this time because you have some social movements beginning to take uh, part. And he argues this idea that promoting industry was in effect and in fact defending the nation's interest from foreign oppressors. And so you see that he argues for this idea of as the economy as a means of almost warfare. But certainly the economy as a way to prove how great your country really is. And so uh, Frederick List's ideas are really vitally important to the German national identity as we see the rise of Germany very shortly. Uh, in addition, the continental banks finally kind of catch up to England and they have two really major ideas that transform the way lending is done and then the, the way business is done. Uh, Initially, people are really kind of worried or un unwilling to invest huge amounts of money into industry because it's a really risky venture. And if something failed, all of your assets were held as collateral. So if you wanted to start a factory in order to get a loan, you might have to put up some other uh, of your assets. And, and if you were even just a shareholder in that and the company went under, and the bank could not recover all its money from the primary investor, they would come after your personal assets as an investor. And so it made people really uh, unwilling to contribute to uh, the development of industry. So what happens is in Belgium, the banks create something called limited liability. And what that essentially says is your liability as a stockholder, as an investor, is limited to your initial investment. So if you uh, and 20 other people help a guy start a business, the only assets that can be taken from you are the money you invest. The bank can no longer come after your house to pay off the the uh, the debts that are owed to them. They can only come and get the amount of money you've already invested. So suddenly your uh, investment becomes a lot less risky. Yes, you may lose your initial investment, but you're not losing everything you have and they're not coming to take from your other investments. So people then become more willing to invest. Uh, other banks in Germany and France use similar ideas, except instead of kind of continuing to patronize the large, uh, wealthy investors, they recognize that, hey, if we get a bunch of, of small investors and add up all their investments, it can be equal to a, a large investor. And that can really lead to us being able to be, have a lot more flexibility because people are willing to take small risks. They're not necessarily willing to take large risks. And so this diversifies the risk and spreads it out significantly more evenly. It also gives opportunities for people who are not fantastically wealthy to be able to afford investing and be able to make some money off this new industry. And one of the major banks at this time that does this is in France. It's the Credit Mobilier, and you'll hear more about them. They're involved in a massive scandal in U.S. history. Uh, there are, as a result of this Industrial Revolution, some pretty significant changes in society. So you have uh, a new class emerges, and that is factory owners. And these people initially uh, rely heavily on family and friends for their funding because there's not a ton of banks or things like that. So they rely on people they know to fund them. Um, and so that's kind of who they start with as well. These factory owners are constantly trying to 
uh, cut production costs. They are looking to l minimize the cost of producing a good and sell it for maximum. That way they can get the most profit. You also see a huge number of these factory owners come from previously discriminated against groups. So people who, whose families may have been well off, but because of who they were identified with, either ethnically or religiously, were never mainstream. So you have a lot of Irish factory owners. You have a lot of Scottish factory owners. You have a lot of Jewish factory owners. People who kind of had been off to the sides of society for a while can kind of take advantage of this new money to become wealthy and have influence. And because of that, these new opportunities, suddenly family ties aren't quite as important, but formal education becomes very important. And it becomes a cornerstone to success for a lot of these uh, people who are involved in this factory life. They need to be educated on how to run a business. They need to make those connections through these schools. And so uh, formal education is really important, and you start to see major universities become a part of that. Uh, also, you see the rise of a class consciousness amongst these factory owners. They finally feel like, because they, a lot of them had come from previously ostracized groups, they finally feel like they can be proud of who they are as this wealthy new class. Um, this is not the only change. You also start to see people who feel like their way of life is threatened. And specifically, you have skilled artisans who view these new factories as undercutting their work. Um, and they view them really as a social evil. These are people who had been the ones sewing uh, clothing or making other manufactured goods in the cottage industry or in their towns and villages. And suddenly they see these being produced on a massive scale. And people see this as undercutting their value and their work. And you even see some of these people attack factories because they're so frustrated and they see their way of life as being threatened. Uh, one person who would have agreed with these is Frederick Engels, and he's a, an economist who argues that the poverty of the new factory workers that these people are facing in these urban, po in these urban poor centers uh, is significantly worse than the poverty faced by the old farm workers. So he sees people as taking a step back, and he blames the industrial uh, capitalism of the time, and he says that it is the fault of greed and these factory owners, and that's causing these people to live this miserable existence. Now, Frederick Engels eventually teams up with Karl Marx and writes the Communist Manifesto, voicing these opinions in a significantly uh, more organized manner. And he's not wrong about life um, being terrible for these people. We see that the for the average factory worker, life is difficult. The costs of goods rise faster than wages. These are people who are working 350 days a year. They generally got Monday off, uh, occasionally a few other days, but they're working uh, 300 days a year. Uh, their, their work days are not short. They're 11 plus hours. And you can imagine standing in a factory working 11 hours six days a week, and how miserable that life would be, only to be living on subsistence levels, not to be able to really enjoy your life. Um, so we see that life is difficult. It turns out that after the wars against Napoleon, so right about 1814, life starts to get slightly better for these working class people. And that's in part because there's relative peace in Europe and life gets kind of better for everybody. Uh, and the people who move into these factories find themselves kind of struggling with this adjustment, especially if they had been involved in the cottage industry. They were unused to the discipline that was demanded of them in a factory. These are people who were used to uh, working when they wanted to, producing however much they wanted to, and getting paid for that. And now they found themselves in a factory having to clock in, clock out, being forced to work under the guidance of a foreman, and really not being able to enjoy themselves. And so they resist this discipline and they're not super productive uh, within this class. And so uh, this is kind of a struggle for early factory workers. You also have these early factory workers living at the factories they had. And they basically had to work in order to get the food and the minimal payment they were offered. Uh, and so it's just really, quite frankly, terrible uh, for these early uh, factory workers. And because so many cottage industry workers refused to make this transition to the factory because the pay wasn't worth it and the hours weren't worth it, the factory owners had to turn to another labor supply, and that was orphans. And orphans are the perfect labor supply because there are, as we've read before and heard about before, there are thousands of these children 
roaming the streets of every major city. And so uh, factory owners would contract out with foundling homes or with parish homes, and they would bring the children in, house them, feed them, and force them to work. And everyone kind of accepted that this was the way things worked. It was a good deal for everybody involved. Uh, eventually, by 1802, people start to recognize that this maybe isn't the best thing, and it's outlawed, at least in England it's outlawed. So you have this new era where people start to move to cities and work in factories as family units, kind of keeping that cottage industry style where everyone's working side by side uh, in the factories. And so maybe the, you know, the mom and dad aren't working next to each other, but they're at least working at the same factory. So you could hire entire families to do various jobs in the factories. At this time, though, there is a shift in gender expectations. And so uh, you start to see the rise of this idea that men would become the main wage earner and, and women would, uh, would not be as involved in working. And so married women in the working classes are less likely to work full time. And there are a few possible reasons for why this happens. Uh, and you can see them here. There are three reasons why historians kind of argue that this may happen. First is the discipline of the factory uh, life and the machines and the speed required and the hard work and the arduous on your feet labor uh, wasn't really great for women, especially when they're pregnant. So uh, when you're pregnant, you can imagine that working in a factory, standing on your feet for 11 hours a day around dangerous machines isn't exactly the best. Another one is this idea that running an urban household in poverty was super time consuming. These are women who would have to re make repairs around the house to shoes, to clothing. They would have to find ways to make food happen. They would have to find ways to earn little bits of extra money here and there. They were so busy trying to make ends meet that they didn't really have the time to go work full time and make ends meet in the house. And lastly, there's kind of this conservative fear that women would begin to start socializing with men outside of proper supervision. That is that uh, men and women working side by side in factories would start talking to each other and being flirtatious and start developing relationships without parents being there to oversee uh, this courtship of their, their daughter. And so that really raised a lot of alarms um, for a lot of people. Another reason is that uh, there are some reform-minded people and as activists at this time, and as they go and see kind of the working conditions, they're horrified to see women working in mines and other difficult and dangerous conditions. And so there's kind of this social push against uh, women working these factory and mine jobs. There, and then as a result of those reform-minded activists, you have some pretty significant legal changes. Uh, the, and, of course, to us today, these seem kind of ridiculous because they still seem pretty miserable. So the first is you have this Factory Act of 1833. And what this does is it limits the workday for children between 9 and 13 to 8 hours a day. Uh, you can imagine a 10-year-old working 8 hours a day. Uh, that doesn't seem like it would happen today because their attention span and just the way they are. But that was the expectation back then, and they thought that was being generous. Once children graduated to 14 to 18 years old, they could work up to 12 hours. Beyond that, there was no limit, at least at this time. Uh, and one of the other key components to this Factory Act is that children under 9 are required to be enrolled in school. So you start to see this compulsory education that started in Prussia starts to move elsewhere, and you see it in England here with this. Uh, another key act is the Mines Act of 1842. This prohibits women and children from working on, in the mines, uh, children under 10, that is. Uh, and this is significant as, in part because these reformers are so horrified at seeing women working in the mines, but also it's starting to put limits on what kind of dangerous child labor there can be. So you start to see this awareness of the dangers of industrialization and people reacting to it. This time period is really characterized by this new social shift where industrialization is a brand new concept and people don't really know how to react to it and they try to figure it out so factory owners try to take as many, much advantage as they can to make as much money workers try to push back the government and society try to figure out where they fall and where this uh this economy is going to lead and what things are going to look like and the result is some legislation that slowly progresses to lead us more to what we recognize today and as part of this pushback against the kind of greed of industrial capitalists, you begin to see labor unions and workers begin to organize themselves in order to protect themselves. 
And this isn't anything terribly new. Guilds had existed for a long time, and they would control who could come in, and it would limit the number of people in each uh, kind of profession. This way they could make sure there wasn't too much competition. Um, but people, factory workers start forming guilds and unions, and this starts to raise some alarm bells because they do become powerful. So the British government initially attacks these monopolies, guilds, and labor unions. They're very involved in making sure that guilds and labor unions don't get much power. And so in 1799, they sign the Combination Acts, which outlaws unions and strikes. It prevents uh, workers from gathering. It prevents them from protesting. It kind of forces the their hand and puts the uh, benefit towards the factory owners um and so this kind of is going on at the same time union members are trying to limit the number of workers they can have um, they're still meeting despite the legal the dubious legal nature of unions at this time and because Parliament realizes that they're not going to be able to stop this workers movement in 1810 they repeal the combination acts um, that doesn't mean unions are legally accepted, they just kind of are kind of in limbo until 1825 when unions are officially legally accepted. And so these, these unions are organizing in order to get better wages uh, and to collectively bargain, but you see workers organizing for other social reasons too. And specifically, this isn't seen in the Chartist movement, uh, and this is a movement in, in England with... Uh, workers demanding that all men be given the right to vote. So this is kind of trying to expand the the Republican nature of the British government. So instead of just the landowning wealthy, the Chartists argue that all men should have this right to vote in order to express themselves. And, and part of this Chartist movement and this whole union movement as, it, as a whole, you begin to see workers developing a sense of their own class identity. They see that they're poor. They see that they're struggling. And there's some camaraderie and some kind of universality in that. And so this is kind of this uh, time period of chaos uh, as industrialization takes over.